about the theme of building autonomy. And um, we're just going to start this off. We're just going to let everybody sort of say a few words about themselves and how they might be interested in the theme here. Um, my name is Rob, and I, I've been involved in uh, the, 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 the to the left and below the anarchist and the autonomous movement for almost as long as I can remember. Um, and it, well, one thing, a name I'm going to drop at the moment, which some of you may recognise, but I had a friend called Colin Ward um, who died about 10 years ago. And Colin was quite well known for writing a book in the early 1970s called Anarchy in Action, which actually came out of a magazine which he, he put together. And um, Anarchy in Action, if you've ever come across the book, is a series of chapters which are all built around the idea of uh, how we, we, we have the, the, the embryo of the society that we want uh, within the society which we're currently living in. It's this idea of uh, building the new world in the shell of the old. And I, I think for me personally that, that this, this is a little bit to do with the idea of autonomy, the idea that we can actually start building structures and organizations. We can, we can look at ourselves as individuals as well, perhaps, and we can look at how we can manage to get uh, elements of autonomy in the world that we live in. At that point, the interesting thing becomes how it scales up and how it gets bigger and how you network it and how you get it going on, on a larger and larger scale. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested this evening that we've we've got um, all the way from um, the, the the foundry in Galicia, which uh, Dennis will tell us a little bit about, and and probably covers a, a, an area of less than a square kilometre, and then we go all the way up to um, a, a, an area with the size of Rojava up in northeast Syria, and uh, again Haval will probably tell us something about that, but I'm I'm guessing that it's a country which is probably or an area which is somewhat similar in size to something like a country like Denmark. So we've, we've got people along with us this evening who can uh, talk about different things in, in different sizes and different scales. And we can also talk about um, how these structures and how these organizations relate to the overall society which surrounds them in political and uh, in, uh, in economic terms as well. I've just been told. I, I, okay, thank you. Take us in. So, look, I, can I, Cindy? Can I come to you first of all on all of this? Um, if you'd like to introduce yourself and tell us a little about about yourself in any way you like, um, and then how does this uh, theme of autonomy? How does it? How does it go with you? And, and how do you understand it? And how do you relate to it? Um, hi. For I, I really. Um want to express some appreciation um, for inviting me here and really lovely to be in a space with everyone um, talking about a um, topic that is seems really near and dear to all our hearts. Um, I, what do I do? I long time uh, diasporic uh, queer Jewish anarchist who engages like in social movements and organizing and I love creating and being part of magical spaces when we catch a glimpse of the world that's um, could be and um, you know, from small scale things. Um, like I'm part of an anarchist summer school, which has unfortunately been put on hold because of the pandemic, um, which is one of the most magical spaces. I feel like everybody acts within that as, as if they want to want to be in the future to, you know, large scale social movements that have held space and um, created, you know, autonomous spaces across um, plazas or cities. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, one reason you invited me here was I um, ended up um, curate, I, I, sort of a doula of, of grief and uh, care, but also um, books. And I, I um, curated an anthology called Deciding for Ourselves, The Promise of Direct Democracy about a year ago on AK Press, which is one reason that led you to invite me here, which tells a bunch of real life stories of, of contemporary spaces of large scale or long lasting um, self-governance. And um, yeah, I guess I was thinking about that in like, I. I really love that you know Colin Ward. I'm like, oh my God, I would love to have known Colin Ward in person. I have such warm, fuzzy feelings from their writing. Um, and I knew uh, Murray Bookchin and people in the circles like that. And I, I feel grateful to our ancestors who've passed along, um, you know, all sorts of understandings. But I, you know, I think Murray's ideas spoke to me and Murray as a person, because we're both Jews that like to wrestle with ideas, um, is this notion of prefigurative. What do we want? Not just what we're against. And so for me, you know, this, what's at stake for me is I want a world filled with love and solidarity and care and, and, and dignity. And I, 
the only way I understand we can do that is by, I, I really love James C. Scott's um, essay where he talks about an anarchist calisthenics is that we have, all we really have is each other. And all we really can do with that is continually exercise our muscles of autonomy together to experiment with, you know, the messiness of what it looks like and the profound beauty of what it looks like to be free people in free spaces. And I don't think you can write about that or theorize about that. I think it's about doing it and um, experimenting and doing it in ways that highlight social relationships that are at cross purposes with colonialism and states and police and capitalism and patriarchy. And we only get good at exercising those muscles about trying to push past that by like throwing ourselves into the messiness of it. And so the last thing I wanna say that I think I just stumbled across a quote the other day that really just struck me that from the Zapatistas, it feels like this time period when like so much is at stake, you know, the, the whole ecosystem to, you know, fascism around the planet to what the pandemic's done. Um, the Zapatistas wrote this really beautiful line, when it seems like nothing remains, principles remain. And so for me, for me I think what's most compelling about it, autonomy is that it's us putting our ethics into practice, embodying mm. that, right? Like love, care, solidarity, mutual aid, they're no good except in how we embody them. So. Mm. Yeah, no, that's cool. I, yes, Colin Ward, he was a lovely man. I, it, it was interesting. You mentioned um, when we were talking a little while ago uh, about Martin Buber as well, because they were, he, was very, he was very influenced by Martin Buber's ideas as well. He was a lovely man, Colin Ward. Yes, I, I, I remember him with a lot of affection. Um, and of course, it's interesting, you know, you mentioned Murray Bookchin and all these things, they kind of link together. You've got Murray Bookchin, the effect that he had on the thought of Abdullah Ocalan, and that's going to come up when we talk about Rojava and, and things like that. But yes, the, 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 the ethical project of, of putting these things into practice and, and living these ideas and, and how crucial that is, which I, I don't know if you did it, if you planned it, Cindy, but that is just a perfect segue for us to turn to Dennis, who's over in Galicia and, and, and how he's uh, Dennis, I'm, I'm coming to you. So, Dennis, listen, would you like to say a few words introducing yourself and telling us how this theme of, uh, of, 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 of autonomy relates to what you're thinking about it? Sure. Um... Yeah, I, 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 I would subscribe to everything Cindy just said there. I couldn't, I couldn't express it uh, in a more beautiful way. Um, me personally, I, I come out of academia and I've dealt with a lot of like French theory and these kind of ideas there that have, I would say, an anarchist sensibility to them. But I'm also an academic dropout. I, I still want to write, but the last few years have more uh, engaged in activism and in um, and, and trying to build autonomy in um, at the foundry, which is where I am now which is basically um, an, an abandoned village in Galicia. There's, there's many abandoned villages in Spain where uh, to, in 2018, we started a project that in the beginning had perhaps as its main motivation um, to try to create a space where people can do their work, whether it's artistic work, academic work, or, or other kinds of work also, uh, outside of big institutions, out, relatively shielded from the forces of, of market and state. And, um, etc. Just create a space where people can be relatively free. Um, so that's been going on for three years. I would say over three years, the accent has shifted somewhat. It's really not a paracademic space right now. There's really more focus probably on self-sufficiency and stuff like that, which I think is, is deeply related to autonomy, right? Uh, Gandhi also said that somewhere. <laughs> Can't have autonomy without self-sufficiency and the other way around neither. Uh, so there's a lot of time goes into the garden and stuff like that, but also, also into recuperating certain knowledges that are somehow you would say lost but they're more they're not really lost they're just like in some corner of global capitalism stuff like forging metal and, and stuff we do we do workshops of metal forging and like these, these kind of things so i've been very involved in that for the last few years um and i'm sure we'll talk about that more later on and then recently um me and some other people we we started a different initiative that we could also talk about which is called freeing space which is, um, which is an attempt to map the, the outside of neoliberal capitalism, to say it like that. And of course, there are people that would claim that outside doesn't exist, people like Mark Fisher, but I think if, if you, it does exist. There's many, many little exoduses or like people trying to escape from the system every, every day. Um, they create stuff, they build autonomy, and we're trying to map those efforts somehow, um, visualize them by doing that. And I, I would say it's almost like a war map, you know, I think... 
there is sort of like a, a war between forms of life and apparatuses of death to 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 put it quite um well to the point uh so so that that map is not finished yet we're still we're still working on that but i think those are the two initiatives that i'm most invested in recently and they're they're both attempts to build uh, autonomy yeah yeah now you, you mentioned one little thing there and, and i certainly want to pick up on an awful lot of themes that you talk about there but i wanted to have a look at i'm going to go to the other two but one of the things which we might want to talk about fairly early on as we're looking towards a definition of autonomy is mm -hmm. how it relates to concepts also like self-sufficiency which you've mentioned there and also yeah. uh, self-management and control i mean in, in a number in some european languages the the, the word autogestion in, in french and so forth it, it kind of means self-management and uh, i've just got ideas buzzing around in my head from what you're saying there and some themes which i want to pick up on but i, I stick to my plan i i was going to go to you here val but you've corrected me your your tea for for for, for te tecosin so I, i'll go to matt next and ask matt to 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 say a few words matt would you like to introduce yourself as well and tell us how you feel that this uh, theme uh, affects you and how it relates to what you've been up to and what you think? Sure, Rob. Thanks again. Thanks so much for being I'm really happy to be here and to talk and think with everyone. And and yeah, what, what Cindy and Dennis are saying, uh, you know, I would just echo a lot. You know, I think there'll probably be a lot of agreement, but maybe maybe the interesting thing to talk about is the differences about where we are and and what autonomy might mean and look like that as opposed to what we think about the concept of it. But uh, I'm at, I'm here in New York City in the borough of Queens. And uh, since 2014, I've been part of Woodbine, which is both a physical space and also a neighborhood-based organizing framework. Um, since we started the project, you know, autonomy has been an important political framework and organizing concept for us. And in a number of ways, maybe as a distinction or departure from certain kind of protest culture or demonstration culture or the idea that we're kind of anti-capitalist or anti-state, um, or even in some ways as a distinction from insurrection or revolution, because building autonomy for us named both a process and a horizon. And um, that horizon was maybe, you know, the intentional and strategic combination of popular cooperation and, you know, the development of communal material infrastructure. Um, and within that, you know, there's various practices, experiments, you know, modes of relation, you know, cultivation of a communal ethos that all cultivate to what we think of or, you know, what we'll call autonomy. Um, and all of that, all of those things help us, you know, grow and expand. Um, recently with the pandemic, um, you know, because of the last seven years of the, the organizing we've been doing in our space and network, you know, we were, I think, in many ways, better prepared and able to devote ourselves to kind of responding to the pandemic and became in March of 2020, you know, full time emergency response hub and mutual aid platform. And, you know, it was fascinating over the last year to see mutual aid become this this mainstream term and framework the way maybe Antifa did, you know, during the Trump administration and, and to think of what mutual aid means in this context of autonomy um, as, as a kind of national or kind of global um, experience, uh, I think is fascinating. Um, you know, Woodbine, we've mostly focused on food insecurity, but I think that itself, you know, points to a lot of, a lot of these questions to deal with networks and material infrastructure and, and the ways people can build partnerships and alliances and coalitions to kind of meet material needs. And I think the last year, you know, we've run a food pantry four times a week for now, I guess, 13 months going on 14 months. And, and that was, you know, none of it was, was necessarily because of funding. It was just because of, you know, Woodbine's a volunteer run space. So none of us are paid. It's all uh, voluntary and, you know, but there's a kind of creativity and resourcefulness that, that is part of mutual aid and part of autonomy. And I think, you know, the fact that we've been able to, to sustain and maintain this food pantry just as a example is, is for us, you know, what we were trying to do. Uh, all this, you know, expanded our social base, the number of participants. And um, last November, we were able to move into a space three times the size of our, of our previous location. Um, you know, you mentioned this question of scale to think about the foundry on the one hand or Rojava on the other, you know, I'm living here in New York and I'm from New York, you know, New York is 8 million people live in the city. The metropolitan area is 20 million people. So for a lot of us, you know, who are dispossessed or kind of precarious, don't have money, 
the question of autonomy really is the social dynamic of uh, cooperation and collaboration and, and how did the dispossessed kind of pool resources together and pool kind of skills and energies and enthusiasms together. And, you know, for us that, you know, is a big part of building autonomy and, you know, the city, you know, normally when people think of communes, they think of something more rural or remote or something, but for us at Woodbine, we've tried to think a bit how to, how to build kind of communal relations inside a kind of horrific, destructive city like New York, which, you know, does include all these people and lots of creativity, energy, ambition. So I think autonomy is, is how to kind of, how to navigate or interface within all these different kind of experiences or registers. So maybe I'll leave it at that for now, but that's sort of where I'm at and what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, I, that's really interesting. And you've got some experience of visiting areas in South America as well, were you saying? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think for us, this idea of autonomy, I think in Chiapas and in the Kurdish movement are the two, you know, I think for all of us, I would imagine on the panel, the two kind of touchstone examples or experiences, especially breaking out of a certain kind of national liberation revolutionary horizon, you know, earlier in, in mid late 20th century to think about how do you build autonomy where you are? And I think that was the kind of intervention of and you know, the last 10, 15 years or something. And I think a lot of us around the world have been trying to apply that in different kind of case to cases. But, you know, num members of Woodbine visited Chiapas. We visited the Kurdish areas of Turkey and Iraq and Syria. We visited, you know, the Zad and France and, you know, Italian movements blocking different infrastructural projects. So all of that, you know, we try to learn from and kind of share experiences, but, you know, apply to where we are, where we live, where we find ourselves. So that's kind of what the horizon of autonomy has been for us. Right. OK. And can I just quick, just quickly ask again back, back about Woodbine, um, how many people are involved uh, directly, uh, indirectly? What, what sort of numbers of people are involved and how many are you reaching? I mean, maybe the kind of administrative aspects of the space, there's about 20, you know, with the food pantry itself as a project, I would say there's about 60 people that help run the food pantry. Right. And, you know, we're reaching, you know, thousand, you know, each week we probably feed a thousand families, um, oh. all, of which, all of which are local to the neighborhood. So we're kind of in, in touch with thousands of people, you know, just locally wow. in our neighborhood or something. But, you know, there's different, I don't know, tiers or scales or something of involvement or engagement or participation. But yeah, maybe there's about 20 kind of core quote unquote, collective members that maintain the space and all the projects and stuff. But the food pantry in this pandemic and kind of disasters really exploded participation. I think maybe this is something we'll talk about is, mm. you know, the pandemic more so than anything else has shown the need for autonomy because of the inability of, of the state or the market to resolve this crisis. So I think something like this is sort of perfect for us to uh, demonstrate, you know, this this political framework as something um, necessary. It's not so ideological. It's just, you know, it's a it's a material necessity. Um, so mm -hmm. I think, you know, we've kind of really grown in, in this moment. Yeah. No. That, right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. There's that's very interesting. There's lots there. Well, um, take us in um, over to to Rajava. I think I think. Almost every one of us has mentioned uh, the place uh, so far. It's 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 quite a sort of a, um, a an important feature uh, with, with within anarchist and autonomous circles, and you, you're there. Um, how 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 do you relate to this uh, idea of autonomy, and uh, how 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 has it sort of manifest itself with, with with what you've been up to and where you're living at the moment? Briefly, <laughs> just quickly cover all the other women. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, Bookchin has been mentioned. That was one of the big authors that brought me here, Ochilan as well, of course, especially his uh, highlighting of positivism. Um, I came to Rojava because I thought it sounded fantastic, as in something of fantasy. I, I, I couldn't believe what they were saying. Uh, so I came here to really try and find out if it could possibly be true, what they were saying. Um, and you know, I thought, let's not be naive about this. I mean, the, the idea that I can go there and actually answer that question is, is not going to happen, right? Um, 
and I touched down in Suleimania in Iraq, uh, went to the first tea room and just the, the answer was just hitting me in the face really, really strongly all the time, you know, and it's just been like that continuously since I've been here that um, the depth and strength of the cultural difference is huge. Um, the understanding of what knowledge is, right and wrong, uh, community or autonomy, religion, uh, disagreement, solutions, problems, that the whole thing is just so deeply differently understood at an epistemological level, so a really fundamental mental level. Um, and that's just been so, you know, I, I really got the answer and I, I moved into Rojava and um, to some degree because of my age and my skills. Um, I've been I've been constantly in in meetings with the friends, which I'll probably talk about later. Um, and just witnessing this incredible harmony of decision making, you know, with with just zero conflict at all. So all of the autonomous organizations here, all of the struggle and meetings and discussions are just without conflict at all. Um, and because Rojava welcomes internationals, you, you see the internationals that come here, they're just constantly fighting over decisions and stuff. And the, the local people are just not doing that at all because of just this massive cultural difference. So I've, I've been thinking about that a lot and having an epiphany pretty much every day for a year it's been exhausting um and i could talk for a year about it it's a very very impressive revolution that has not failed to impress me one bit we're gonna have to ask you what the downside of it is at some point in the evening but the more important question is do you prefer playing the six string or the bass <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm i'm about to get an electric guitar here actually oh, wow. distortion pedals because i'm a rock guitarist i'm not quite sure how that's going to go down in the military base that i'm in but we'll see <laughs> oh okay i'll play bass with you online sometime then okay do that yeah. <laughs> um, thank you Liz, this it's very interesting there's there's commonalities to what all you people are talking about but there's differences as well um one of the questions which I'd put down and I thought that we might spend some time talking about if we if we want to is how we build autonomy that that that's been the, the choice of the title for for this meeting this evening building autonomy how do we build autonomy or alternatively perhaps do we build autonomy does it develop in its own way what are the um what are the prerequisites for autonomy to to, to sort of come about as it were I've, I've got my own thoughts about it I don't want to jump in uh, too much with those uh, very 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 obviously in a way i suppose with the foundry and with woodbine you might be able to talk to us a little bit about um how those projects actually got off the ground and how we start how they started it off i'm wondering also cindy if you might like to talk a little bit about your anarchist summer camp and um uh, how that works as an autonomous uh, community and how that develops as well. But I, I think, first of all, if, if we look at this question and if we look at it with you over in Rojava, uh, Tikasin, again, just, just staying with you for a moment, I think most people probably see this as actually coming out of the civil war. But I, I think you've been you've been also studying some of the roots of, of, of Kurdish culture and, and looking at the ideas of Abdullah Ocalan and things like that. Do, do you, ha having spent a year in the place, are you able to put your finger on what the roots are of, of what has happened there and where it's actually sprung from? Yeah, that's quite a big question. Um, so um, I actually went to the university. I teach English at the university twice a week. And one of the reasons I did that was because I wanted to be talking to people who had no political education and said we're not political. So these are these are English students to really find out what their culture was and compare it with the revolutionaries that are around me who are obviously going through education systems and things like this as well. And I think that the, the culture that has enabled autonomous meetings and decision-making to happen so harmoniously was here already. 
Um, so, so when it when it happened, that that was really and the, the, I mean, there's an enormous amount of other factors that came in. You know, like a lot of oil. The revolution's right. very very rich. We, I mean, we're selling oil at ten percent market price, and we've still got bags of cash. Right. Um, the the fact that many many different identities were forced into one area, Rajab, you know, Syriacs, Yazidis, Turkmen, Kurds who had all been oppressed by nation states and then had to go onto the battlefield with ISIS. I mean, revolutionaries have said to me here, if we hadn't have been attacked by ISIS, I'm not, not sure that the nationalities would have then worked together so well, you know, and not that we wanted to be attacked by ISIS, obviously it was not a particularly pleasant thing. Um, the history of the PKK, of, of course, you know, um, the, the, the involvement of women very actively um, throughout the 80s and 90s in the PKK, really gaining strength there. And the, the um, I mean, women should definitely, and the, the feminism of Rajar is, is, is not something that the revolution does as well. It is the revolution. You know, it's the fundamental base of it. And the, the concept of women's ideas as opposed to men's ideas, these social constructs, of course, not literally men and women, although it does relate to history literally as well. Um, and so the, the, the quiet period between, I think, 2002, 2004, where Ocalan completely came up with this whole new ideology and the PKK reformed um, on this different basis. Um, with 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 these women's ideas at the center um that coming into place what is it six seven years before the actual revolution and this whole change of ideology which i don't know if that's ever happened in history before the, the whole revolution changes its ideology from what from one to another um before it goes into revolution um so do you, do you see the ideas of autonomy which you're seeing around you currently at the moment, do, are they really quite deeply rooted in the ideas of uh, uh, Ocalan or is it just more of a cultural, I'm, I'm, I don't know if this is the right way to put it, but is it a political development coming out of his ideas, do you feel, or is it a cultural development? One could jump over to the Zapatistas down in, in Chiapas and almost ask the same question. It, their revolution, has it got its roots in Mayan culture or has it got its roots in sort of European autonomous type theory and, and so on and so forth? And uh, Ocalan's, he's affected by Bookchin and ideas like that. I just wonder if you get the feeling that the, the ideas around you and how they're being put into practice, if they're being driven more by culture, more by um, politics, you're talking about the gender question as well. It's probably, it's got to be a mixture of all of that, but does one of them come out more strongly than the other? Not sure I can make that calculation as, I mean, as such directly at that. I mean, Obviously, you've got a multi-dialect language. So Kurdish has very different dialects. I, I can't talk Afrin or Kobani, for example. They're so substantially different. Um, another one is that you've got a very multi-religion, uh, multi-identity situation here, which mm. nation states aren't traditionally that good at. <laughs> um they got you know this singularity that they want um you've got the fact that kurdistan spans several other countries which are all extremely focused on preventing differences in society this singularity this linger side this attack on anything that's different um and you've got the rejection of dominant male behavior within the feminist basis of what's what's coming there and and you know obviously ha the, the, the um having a, a centralized system instead of lots of different heterogeneous autonomous things this centralized system is, is very dominant male uh, mm. concepts as well um the bottom-up democracy as again instead of kind of top-down stuff is is a rejection of dominant male um and again, you know, uh, Rojava, 70% rural. Yeah. Um, majority of the people excluded from 
government administration posts because they were Kurdish. Um, have suffered greatly the, the, the nation state oppression, like forcing them to only grow wheat and arresting them, arresting yes. them if they Kurdish, all these things. So the rejection of the nation state leading, I think, to the uh, logical, logical, I don't know, conclusion that uh, autonomous um, units would be um, better options. So this this big multicultural area has, has found a certain unity in adversity. It's had ISIS on the one hand, it's had uh, oppression from Damascus on the other, and, and that sort of forged a, a, a certain commonality of interest, I suppose, really, hasn't it, in a sense, um, which, which has been also... Um, you know, helped along perhaps by 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 some of the, some of the theories which are in 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 the cooking pot as well at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. And the rest of you, please feel free if you're bursting with a question that you'd like to ask each other. Do 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 that, please. I wonder, Dennis, if we could jump across to Galicia um, and and this notion then of actually building autonomy and what the experience that you've had with the foundry, how it started, um, and and how it's developed. I don't know, difficulties which you've had along the way, perhaps, um, major successes that you feel which surprised you. Maybe you did something, things went better than, than you thought they might be. But, but what, has been the, what has been the experience of the foundry from the beginnings and over time? Um, well, I mean, how the foundry started, it's, it's a strange story, right? I, I, um, I always worked in university and wanted to, I was disturbed by institutions, by big institutions, because I feel at some point you're just investing time in reproducing the institution and not in the work that the institution should facilitate. So I wanted to create these outside spaces and had some experience with some of them. Um, and, and then I, at some point, fell into a bunch of money because of Bitcoin, really. Uh, so so then I bought this village that now I'm at some point planning to communize if I found the appropriate legal form. So what I, I call it autonomy because it sort of exists outside of state and market structure somehow. But it's it's uh, there. There is the fact that it's also, to some extent, my property at the moment, and people do see me as sort of the guy running it, which makes me very uncomfortable. Um, but it's something that's hard to overcome. Um, I think if you're sort of socialized in leftist milieus, then something like horizontality and like these assembly structure, they like if you're socialized in that, that's normal. If you're not socialized in that. And there's some some cultural learnings or something that you sort of have to have to get rid of first, right? Before before that just becomes normal. So that's something I I really um, sometimes struggle with, but it's also something that I don't know. We try to put into practice. We do assemblies, etc. Um, and what we've done in three years is really quite. I mean, it, it was a place that was abandoned for fifty years, and and now it's it's up and running and it's nice. Um, and it's really an, an effort in building infrastructure outside outside of state and market, building resources that you can then share. Uh, perhaps later on, we can also talk how that would interact with city spaces because we have the capacity to grow food and to 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 build shit and like that sort of functions outside of capitalism. And I think if you want to build autonomy on a in a way that can actually uh, have have an effect on the world or something, you have to make these networks of mutual aid also and link these spaces with each other. And I think that's not 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 nearly happening enough about the cultural um aspect that you were talking about before i think galicia is also a very interesting case and that's actually something i didn't even know before arriving here but uh 25 percent of galician land is still common land um like so like capitalist modernity hasn't really completely colonized galicia, galicia in a way there's there, like like villages will have like 500 hectares perhaps 500 hectares of common land and they get the wa their water from that, they get their wood from that, they get their mushrooms from that, they rent out part of it to put windmills, they get some income that they then like decor, like renovate houses with to make cultural centers. So this is this is in Galicia very strong, this, this tradition, which is, I would say it's somewhat patriarchal, like traditionally only the men of the family could go to these assemblies of what they would do with the common land, etc. cetera. Um, so there, there's patriarchal roots and everything there, but that that's sort of like, uh, feeling of hey we organize as a community and like fuck the state that feeling is you feel that here um which which is which is and, and the state is like they know that this, nowadays in spain they they uh they ident they they um they say energy is a public good so if you as a 
as someone who's a, who's a commoner who, who's, or, who's organizing common land you don't want to rent out your space that, 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 like your land to the windmills uh, they can expropriate it and like these are these are processes etc so like the state facilitates theft of the common land and of course franco was stealing all of it and then people go to the government with these 300 year old scrolls showing their use rights and and they get them back so there, there's this this is this is still very vibrant in the rest of europe that's that's a fight that was lost in the 18th century basically or the early 19th century and here that, that's still there and you feel that in the people's culture and that's something that's very interesting and i had no idea of that before arriving here to be honest but now i'm a, bit, a little bit involved in it um yeah but, uh, but yeah i don't know i also was wondering actually about um uh, uh, like you say that it's a very rich revolution um historically countries with a lot of oil haven't turned out to be the most democratic um uh, countries generally like uh, like i think with, with coal, when coal was the main fuel, there were like strikes and they would like incapacitate an economy. And because of that, there was a lot of worker power that had some sort of democratizing tendencies. And with oil, uh, that, that was just, well, I think that was probably one of the reasons they moved to oil, right? To get around that, you can ship it easier. But like, is, is there some of a, a tension between this influx of oil money and, and this, this sort of horizontal decision-making process or, or not? I was, I was curious about that. If I can ask, no, I'm sorry. Do, yeah. No, I was interested in that, what Tekerson was saying about the oil. Yeah, does it cause that tension? Um, I'm afraid I can't answer that question. Um, I don't actually know the exact financial control system and delivery of the oil into revolutionary hands and how exactly that is controlled. Um, I imagine it's probably heterogeneous. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I don't I don't know how that's that's coming through. Um, I mean, the Americans have still got an interest in the oil in the area, haven't they? I mean, even Trump, he, he, when he was pulling all his troops out and everything, he, he made it quite clear that they were going to stay for the oil, didn't he? Did you do you know if the Americans, or is that in northern Iraq where they were having more control over the the petrol supply? And is it you don't know? I, I but but I suppose the SDF has probably got a, a little bit of a control over that sort of situation. Um, so an SDF commander told me recently that we'd sold some of the oil oil fields to the Americans. Right. Um, that's about all I know about that. No, okay. It'd be an interesting thing to research that. I, I guess maybe the Rajava Information Centre might be uh, a place to go for information along that sort of a route. No, it, it, yeah, interesting. Yeah, um, just back to you a moment, Dennis, because I just wanted to pick up on one thing before I turn to the other two, and that is that you were saying about how there's a certain anti-state feeling within the area that you're in. Do you find that, I'm interested, is that actually an anti-state feeling or is it an anti-Madrid feeling? Because uh, obviously within Spain, there's, there's, there's some, some inter-regional rivalry and so on and so forth. And I asked that question a little bit. Here I am in the United Kingdom where we've got Scotland and Wales on the periphery as well. And the, the movements for independence in those areas, they are still very state driven. They want mm. their own states. They're not anti-state. They're just anti-London, I suppose, effectively, is what it turns out to be. Um, do you get a feel in Galicia of whether the history of more progressive movements, anarchist movements and so on and so forth, have still left their mark and it is anti-state? Or is it a regional expression, do you feel? No, I feel like I feel in Catalonia and Basque country, I think they, they want their own state. In Galicia, I'm sure some people uh, want that, but I but I think this 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 groundedness of the commons and everything goes beyond that. Um, I, I don't think they strive for state form. It's more um, a desire to organize locally, communally. Uh, these assemblies they function on consensus principles, etc. And they're like, yeah, we take care of our own resources. And and there is. In relation to the state, of course, Franco told them to speak uh, Spanish and made Spanish the main language in public school, etc. Which is somehow nice for me because I, just, I don't speak Galician, to be honest. But uh, but but of course, there is some resentment about that. I'm probably uh, it also goes much further back, um, like like the whole um, external colonialism of Spain, like that Spain became an empire in the 17th century, is based on internal colonialism. Is based on uh, you had this, this triangle of forces in the 17th and 18th century of um, the state that needed wood to build 
big ships to, to defend their empire. Uh, industry, iron industry that needed wood to, 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 to melt iron. And then people that said like, no, we have to cook. We have to heat our houses. And uh, over time, the state and industry, they sort of won there. Um, and, but, but like, and the commons land were privatized to some extent, they still 25% left. But I, but I think this, this sort of expression of uh, communal self-government runs, runs even deeper than the formation of the Spanish state as we know it now. Um, and, and, and those institutions still exist. People that make claim to common lands, communities that have claims to common land, those, those claims go back four or 500 years sometimes and they have these old scrolls and everything. So, so that, that, that's not really the same as like Catalonia doing a referendum to become a state. In Galicia, that's not very strong. Um, mm. I, I think it runs deeper. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, is it, Cindy, is there a movement for liberation in Pittsburgh uh, to currently underway? <laughs> I'm just here temporarily. Uh, I was thinking when people were talking. I don't know. I was just thinking about the different. Um, yeah, I, I I feel the so-called United States is is one of the harder places to um, engage in, like sort of long-lasting forms. Um, of, of building autonomy um, be, because it's sort of sort of so ahistorical and kind of people look through the lens of the individual first versus sort of communal. Um, but yeah. um, one of the best, I feel like one of the best spaces I've ever, I, I spent a lot of time in Montreal. Usually I haven't been able to because the border's been shut, which is why I'm in Pittsburgh right now <laughs> um, because of the pandemic. But um, yeah, I've been going there for a long time. And I was thinking about that space is like what sort of that sort of chicken and egg, what comes first? Do you build autonomy or is autonomy already there? All these things that have to come into it. And I mean, almost all the examples, I was in Montreal for, um, I think it was the largest student strike in history of North America, longest lasting for about six months, about nine years ago. Um, but what was what was striking about that was that it was really more of a, um, the word in French for strike um, has within it the word dream. And yeah. it wasn't a shutting down, it was an opening up, but that moment that allowed, it wasn't just a student strike, it was a social strike that became, the city became an autonomous city. <laughs> it really felt like you walked through the streets and you felt like the people were, um, yeah, it's like, it's, it's this magical moment. I, I, th I think that's what's so interesting about autonomous spaces. You just, there's this kind of instant that clicks where you realize you're, you kind of gone through a, yeah, you you can feel. I really liked what you said when you went to when you went to Rojava. It just felt different all of a sudden, right? And so I think Montreal during that time, it it was flipped around where the the city felt magical and romantic and sensual, and everyone was self organizing, whether that was around art or poetry or public spaces or neighborhood assemblies or you know how the strike was being managed. But if you just thought it happened in just that moment, you'd be completely missing <laughs> what happened. So you'd have to go back, you know to the 1960s when um, there was a, you know, an upheaval in, in who had power in, in, um, in that province and especially around education and structures were started within um, um, to decenter the sort of elite control of knowledge, which ended up being an elite control of power, created these um, sort of schools that are free for people between what, what is considered, you know, when you're in your late teens to early twenties and almost everybody since the sixties has been going to those and they all are structured around assemblies. So people decide for themselves. I, I, to me, I guess I'll come back to what is autonomy. Autonomy is nothing unless we have the power to decide for ourselves. And we, right. and to me, that's, um, I'll come back to Bookshund as a point. I, I like, you know, he was a dear friend and I, I'm influenced by a lot of his ideas, but his, you know, his understanding of direct democracy became so rigid in a way. It's like, here's the model. And to my, to me, it's like how we decide for ourselves has to look different in every single space or otherwise it's someone imposing, you know, imposing a decision-making structure. So um, in, in that, in, 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 in Montreal and in that province where people had the practice of deciding for themselves in this, in this way that was structured around how culturally people think about deciding for themselves, so they had that practice, but it's also in a, in, a, in that city. One reason why I love that city is there's this kind of sense in general that people should have space in public to decide their lives for each other themselves. So the parks, for instance, are constantly full of people self-organizing. There's a lot of social life that happens outdoors, maybe because you know the, the climate limits the outdoor beautiful times to a small smaller part of the year. But there's this real culture of sort of feeling like 
we should be able to decide what our city looks like. And when you put those things together over decades, I don't, you know, how do you separate um, decades of preconditions to this moment when something happens? And so to, to use that student strike again, a lot of people are like, well, where did this come from? Because suddenly there was hundreds of thousands of, of, there's a lot of different schools in that city. And almost all the schools were on strike at the same time. So the whole city was shut down. And then other groups started striking and pretty much the whole city had stopped life as it was and was doing life as it could be. And, but the reason that happened was because those structures that have been started in the sixties, students within all the multiple hundreds of assemblies, there's a bunch of different ones at all the different schools. They all decided that they wouldn't strike for autonomy until they had enough of them that were willing to do it. And that took three years, I think. So there was a sense of building towards something, but who could have predicted that once you even build towards something, right? And so I guess I want to come to this interesting moment to me and every time, you know, I've been part of other spaces that have just seemed to appear from nowhere almost overnight, um, is that the need to be dynamic and to not, you can build toward it and then things happen that you can't even imagine and you have to be dynamic and flexible and dreamy. And so I, I always think of the role and I guess to me, it's, you know, we can look at preconditions, we can look at structures of autonomy. And then we also have to look at what it means to have dreamers and visionaries and people who are flexible and agile. And so part of building autonomy for me is our ability to, to remind ourselves that we need to be playful and joyful and dynamic all the time. Right. And, and so again, I, why that moment in Montreal felt so unique for those six months was people opened up the space, not for sort of the dreariness of, of, you know, the death culture we face, but to create life. So the streets were literally visually the whole landscape of the city changed. It there was art and beauty and poetry and pop-up music and marches every night that weren't marches. They were just social gatherings that went on for six hours every night, day after day. And yeah, I, what is that? What is that? You know, you were, there's a need to kind of manage and build in a sense, like self-manage and self-organize and self-build toward autonomy. And then there's just the beauty and the joy of what it means when we're actually doing it, which I think you can't build toward, but when it happens, you have to understand how do we, how do we keep those spaces open as long as we can so that that feeling of what we have. And so I'll just, I guess wanna end on that moment. I think why that moment, one reason it fell apart and why places maybe like, you know, why some of the spaces that are able to last longer is their dynamism and their flexibility and their ability to move through um, uncomfort, discomfort and messiness, I think has to be on values that are, we would understand to be feministic of, you know, what do you value the role of care and the role of when people, you know, how do we, how do we, yeah, how do we hold solidarity and healing and getting us through the hardships of life and I think, you know, like the Montreal student strike in a sense that moment if for six months, the city was sort of self-managing and there was just absurd assemblies constantly like on all sorts of levels, you know, by the block, by the neighborhood, within workplaces, within schools, et cetera, within art collectives, within literary collectives, within educational spaces. But it, it you know, it came up against in a sense, it's inability to, you know, gracefully sort of grapple with, um, you know, feministic and queer and other sort of cultural values. And one of those cultural values was a long history of indigenous um, building autonomy within that, within that space called Canada. And it came up against the limitations of what does it mean to do that when you're still a settler, <laughs> a settler colony structure, right? And so I don't know the messiness of how we grapple with it. So on the one hand, you could say, okay, that space died. I mean, almost overnight, that space shut down and disappeared, which was absurdly heartbreaking almost everyone you know who was part of which was the whole city kind of went into a collective depression I think for at least a couple of years um but I don't think things end and I think the threat of that kind of self grappling with how those spaces shut down some of the most powerful um autonomous spaces of indigenous um prefiguration and self-governance building on their own cultures that go back thousands of years of how decision-making happens and looks mostly based around storytelling and mythology and healing rituals, very powerful. Those have been some of the most powerful building autonomy toward decolonization struggles. Um, you know, very exemplary, I would say in, in, globally, um, you know, like building off of, you know, also being, in, being inspired by the Zapatistas and others, but, but, pre-existing them as well. 
And I think there's been a shift across so-called Canada um, to people that built autonomy through sort of colonialist structures that saw their own limitations to being in, in profound solidarity with over the last, um, especially, yeah, the last uh, five, six years with some of the um, building autonomy struggles to use that language within indigenous um, um, territories and lands and communities um, across so-called Canada. And those are powerfully and strongly led by feminist values. So I really wanna, I think, I, I, I don't know, the, like that when I was putting together that anthology, Deciding for Ourselves, it was just such, felt such an humble honor to let people tell stories, to be helped just you know, edit stories. And to me, the commonality around all those stories, because each example is completely different. Some come through black radical traditions, some through indigenous traditions, um, you know, they're done all, some are in big cities, some are in small cities, they're across all the globe. But to me, what really held them together is when things get hard is how do we handle social relationships of trust and care and love? And when we don't handle those well, things fall apart, right? Mm. And, and I, you know, there's no formula for that again, but I just really wanted to point, I think the ones that seem to have lasted longer are the ones, you know, we can look at the Zapatistas and, you know, they have, uh, and, you know, they came up against the limitations of patriarchy and they could have fallen apart, but instead they, you know, have held to an ethic of what does it mean to be humble and um, open yourself up to what's dis the discomfort and allow for um, the critique of the feminist critique of that project to not be, not, not be destructive pain, but to be generative pain right? and to, yeah. to build a different world. And yeah, so I guess I, I'll just end on this. I just think when I've been parts of these spaces, I think it's the sorrow of them falling apart. We have to also understand that when they fall apart that we learn from each other. And I love this, us all talking here is like, there are all these projects are so interconnected, right? You know, you can say, okay, there's, you know, theorist ideas and cultures and histories that go together and we learn from each other, but you can't, none of these are models that we can replicate. So I guess I keep coming back to like, all we really have are the social relationships that we forge and how long we can keep those different kinds of social relationships open and vibrant and growing and for life, right? Um, for life, for life, for life, because we're producers of life and creators of life. And when different individual autonomous projects die, those, the memory of them doesn't die. We see them weaving through others. And I mean, that's where I find the promise, you know, it's a, mm -hmm. and learning from, but each one's gonna look vastly different if we think we can come up with some sort of formula or model for building autonomy we're already start, we're already thinking like a state <laughs> you know we're thinking like capitalism we're thinking like all the structures we hate right because we want to control what happens in someone else's territory or region um i think the scaling up questions to me is not so interesting is how we can be in profound solidarity across spaces as opposed to scale scaling up you know that's like a cap to me more that, that again it's sort of thinking like capitalism like how can we grow these things bigger i don't i think how can we nurture and culture and keep them thriving and interconnected with each other is a more interesting question. Let's look at that question actually Cindy because you raise it there and that's a very good question and let's 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 hold it there with that one for a moment whether we do want to scale it up or whether we want to network it and I'm just going to say something myself from what you were saying there which which strikes me here and it's it goes back to your book and it goes back to what you were saying about Montreal. I know nothing about this event that happened in Montreal that you've just told me about. I just didn't know anything about it. When I read your book that you'd put together, you know, the uh, Deciding for Ourselves, and you had that chapter about the place in Mexico with that city which had set itself free and it was going autonomous. Nothing to but do Chiron, with that. Chiron, Chiron well, well, which I'm probably, okay. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but Chiron. Okay, yeah, that's it. And nothing to do with the Zapatistas, which we've all heard about. And I've talked to a number of people who know all about Zapatistas, but they had not heard about the, what had happened in Chiran as well. And I mean, where I am over here in the UK, I, I have a lot of contact with people in the British Labour Party and they, they we've had Jeremy Corbyn, you've, you, you probably have heard of him and he was seen as very progressive, very sort of a Bernie type figure and all the rest of it. You talk to these people, they have no idea what's been happening in Rojava. They have no idea what has been happening in Chiapas in Mexico. And so when you want to sort of net, when we want, whether we want, well, whether we want to scale up or whether we want to network these little things. And Dennis, I hope you're going to talk about your freeing spaces project that you're working on here, because it really does sort of inform this a lot. Wh whichever way we're looking at it, it's a question of really sort of just making people more aware of 
what is actually happening in the way of positive things are, are around this planet that we're living on, because there is quite a lot happening there. I just, I wonder about that one there. If I go to you, Matt, and if we just take this question of um, either scaling up or networking or whatever, and, and, and you, you, you've been saying that during the pandemic with what you've been dealing with with Woodbine, that you've expanded, I suppose, in order to satisfy a need that you've come across. And that might be part of what's going on here. But do you have any thoughts about what we're talking about there? Does, does autonomy scale up? Does it just develop on its own? Does it come as a spark? Do we want to network? What are your feelings about a question like that? I mean, I think I agree with Cindy on two points that she was making, or a number of, but two, two specific things. I agree with her kind of skepticism of this framework of scaling up. And I prefer, you know, the, the, what she countered with was scaling across or something. Um, and I think that's an important kind of uh, distinction to make. I also would kind of agree with this, this notion that Cindy was making about, um, you know, I think Rojava has been such an inspiration for a lot of people, but I think some of the kind of bookshanites in the US or around the world want to apply a kind of formal transposition to that uh, into an American context or into an urban context. And I think that's precisely what's not interesting about it. And you, your earlier question to, uh, to our friend in Rojava about this kind of potential um, split between whether it's the culture of kind of Kurdish life or versus some kind of politics or ideology and where we can maybe approximate uh, very much in New York and my own context is we're thinking about the cultural dynamics, the kind of subjective conditions for autonomy. And, you know, as Cindy was mentioning, you know, the, um, the forms of socialization or individualization that, you know, we experience in the U.S. and I think throughout the West are so harsh, you know, especially in New York where, we have these cultures of like real estate and celebrity or something, you know, driving um, decision making and how people live their lives. So, so much of what we're doing in terms of building autonomy is precisely to try to build a culture, to build a culture or a kind of soil or terrain where something like autonomy could grow. And I think that kind of cultural orientation is different than the a, a sort of bookchanite, crude, formal, bureaucratic transposition of how do you run a general assembly or how do you run a working group or all of these things are, are not interesting at all because there's this ethical kind of cultural dynamic of what autonomy has to mean or look like, which will vary, you know, from village to village, never mind, you know, continent to continent. There'll be different touchstones that we're drawing on. Um, and I think, you know, something also Dennis was talking about, you know, with the academic context of, you know, these institutions. And I think in, you know, in the West or whatever, we're all struck with these institutions that have been, have produced us that we then get put towards reproducing them. And the, the, the kind of move or gesture of building autonomy is this experience of withdrawal or secession or kind of exodus or refusal from these institutions to try to kind of reproduce something else. And I think this, this comes to a kind of feminist critique or orientation once you get into the terrain of reproduction and not just reproduce, reproducing discourses, but re reproducing bodies, you know, children, you know, a space, you know, having to clean it and, and, and maintain it and care for it. And once you kind of, you know, for us and at Woodbine, once we pivoted from being a, a group of friends or comrades or an affinity group or something to running a physical space that gave us this kind of more public facing, you know, diplomatic kind of dynamic, but it also gave us this reproductive current, you know, reproducing, you know, we had dinners, for example, every week, every Sunday for seven years up until the pandemic. So we had to figure out how to cook for dozens of people, how to kind of get food, then how to clean up. And, and these are basic kind of forms of socialization that unfortunately people don't have, you know, people don't know how to cook. They don't know how to clean up after themselves. You know, it's more typical that you would just use the, the money relation to resolve these things. You know, you pay someone else to cook for you. You pay someone else to clean up after yourself. And these very basic forms of life, we just simply don't have. And I think, you know, the city and kind of capitalist modernity is wanting to reproduce that and wanting to expand that 
and reproduce that in different parts of the, in, you know, villages in Galicia and parts of, you know, Northeastern Syria and, you know, throughout, throughout the globe, wherever it's possible, we're trying to reproduce a way in which we don't know how to live and we don't know how to survive. So building autonomy very much for, for me, and I think us Woodbine is, is to reproduce a different culture where something like autonomy is even imaginable or desirable, or we can even kind of know what we're talking about when we use that word. And I think, you know, these kind of cultural or ethical things are just as important as any discursive ideological, quote unquote, political kind of framework we might apply to them. Um, and I think that's one of the, the differences I think I see with um, some of the people interested in, you know, direct democracy in a certain way, which means how do we run an assembly or how do we run a meeting or like you were talking about, Rob, with the different kind of socialist governing projects, we're thinking about how to govern cities or nations. And I think that's where this scaling up kind of horizon looks towards. But, you know, if we can't, you know, imagine some kind of scaling of self-governance without this cultural sensibility of kind of shared life, you know, shared communal life, if, if that's not on the table or kind of part of the discussion, and we're just talking about governance, then we're stuck within kind of statecraft, basically. And I, I'm not sure that's gonna, gonna get us anywhere. And I think precisely the Zapatistas and the Kurdish movement by abandoning that framework in 1994 and, and, and the early 2000s for the Kurdish movement is was so liberatory and, and kind of what that kind of ethical shift to, to kind of building and developing autonomy where we are in our own local and who are is what we can apply, you know, in New York City or Pittsburgh or London or wherever we might define ourselves, because we understand to some extent who we are, where we are, and what's around us, and can start to experiment with what kind of different ethical experiences might we want to reproduce. Um, so hopefully that touches on some of the question or, you know, what everyone was talking about. So it does. Yeah, there's so much to, 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 to delve into there and to unpack. I just wondered, do any of you want to sort of pick up on anything that's being said here? I've got so many things I could do, but I'll give, it the, give the floor to anybody who wants to j jump in and say anything. Hi, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm... I'm inside a bottom-up direct democracy, which is mind-blowing. Um, and there's hierarchy and there's leaders. So, um, you know, I, I actually went to a Rojavan education, this amazing piece of history. I had a 40-day education as well, um, which was incredible to see. And a lot of it was, of course, about personality um and making our personalities better as a quote i can't remember who from probably ochelan 95 percent of this war is against our own personalities and five percent is a mechanized war another quote if our personalities are not good we cannot build anything good and i'd like the reverse to be for, uh, true as well um so the, um, I'm going to try and describe something that's in Rojava that I haven't seen discussed, haven't seen talked about anywhere else, um, because the, the books on Rojava tend to focus on the positive aspects of it, as in the, the positivistic aspects of it, like democratic confederalism, um, as if democratic confederalism was the model. Um, and I think it isn't the model at all. I think it's a, I think it's an anti-model. I think it's a system in place to stop people trying to force models. Um, and so the, the enormous number of meetings that I've been involved in, in this bottom up democracy, um, they're all around friends' houses. Um, and if you stand by the road at night, you see the same people carrier type going past a thousand times because the revolution bought all the same car. They just bought thousands of the same people carry. It's a white one with a little mirror on the back. And they're just like this every night, just thousands of them just going to each other's friend house. So they're not coming to a central place to have an assembly. They're not using consensus decision-making. They're not voting. They're not coming with agendas. 
and they're not making decisions somehow directly or making proposals. They're actually just going to their friend's house. Um, and, you know, I've been in meetings like with generals of armies and what would be the equivalent of, of, of government ministers and things like this. And Rojava, uh, th this, this whole model, this massively interactive thing that I would call society, uh, works on responsibility without authority. So if you're responsible for this, like all of Rojava in this specific area, you have no authority over it. And this, this was kind of a crazy thing to me initially. And I was in all of these meetings and I eventually said to my friend, who is the most powerful person I've sat, next, sat in a meeting with so far? And he said, it's, it's the really tall guy with the curly gray hair. And I'd never heard him speak. In all the meetings we'd been in, I'd, ne I'd just never heard him speak. He sleeps on my couch at the moment. He's there in the morning in his jeans and T-shirt. Um, and he makes a tea and asks me if there's anything I need. Um, and I think this responsibility without authority and its relationship to bottom-up democracy is key somehow. And these, these, these education programs that I went through were there to reduce my ego. Um, people come to these meetings, they don't, they don't have an agenda of ideas in their mind that they want to tell other people that they think they should implement. They come there and they, they, they seem to just be curious and excited about all the other people. Um, and it's very difficult to pinpoint any of the decisions. The decisions seem to slowly construct themselves, almost as if, I mean, I'm exaggerating, I'm painting a particular side of this, obviously, I've been in meetings where they've said, oh, we need to do this, you know. Um, so I think, I think that's the model. I think democratic confederalism, that I think that is what I'd like to call society, when that amount of interaction is happening because the neighbors come in, the neighbors will sit next to a general and talk. You know, the, the, the whole community is involved in this. And I think that when that amount of interaction is happening, the society itself becomes capable of constructing decisions itself. And therefore the, 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 the elected delegates, if that's what they do, um, and obviously it's heterogeneous in Rojava and changing, so this concept of this structural model just doesn't work. Um, that those elected delegates, not only, I mean, I think their role is actually just to summarize the decision that's bubbling up through the society anyway. It sounds like they're making it because they're the ones who are saying it on the TV, but actually they, they don't have any choice. You know, they couldn't try and make a decision that wasn't fundamentally flowing through this thing called society already. Um, and in fact, of course, they're part of it as well. They're in all the meetings and they're part of the society. So the social construction, the changing understanding of what feminism means, the changing understanding of what uh, uh, democracy means or freedom means or um, um, relationships are, these are all ebbing and changing because we don't have dictionaries here. There is no central control on what meaning is. And all of these dialects of Kurdish are uh, just change you, you talk to someone here and one sentence they will pick construct from three different languages and three different dialects in the same sentence to construct meaning and it's changing um and i think that's that's the model and i think that's a very feminist model um and the higher up this hierarchy and it is a hierarchy the people that the top of this hierarchy they have information that people don't have down the hierarchy you know uh, it is power definitely power there but um the higher up the hierarchy you go the sweeter the people become i mean they're just absolutely amazing people um constantly trying to kill the dominant male as ochanan says inside each of them um, so they don't try and force their own ideas on, 
on other people and stuff. Um, so this is what I'm in, inside of here. And this is what's impressing me so much, the fact that I can, and now because of my education, I can arrive in a meeting and I almost forget all of the ideas or the opinions, I hope not, but opinions that I might have on things. And I'm, I'm just enjoying the other people there. And then maybe one of them is curious about, they're all curious about me that information and ideas that I might have might flow to the top. If that happens, fine, naturally, organically, subjectively, whatever. Um, yeah, so I think I think that's the model. Anybody want to pick up on anything there? It's so interesting. It's so interesting just to be able to speak to somebody who's living it rather than, as you say, you read the books about it, blah, de, blah, de, blah, de, blah. But um, yeah. no, it's so interesting to hear somebody who's actually living there. Do, you, do any of you want to pick up on anything there? Yeah, no, I just, I, I really appreciate you describing that. I, I was thinking when you were talking, like the, the, the moments that I've experienced or, you know, or when you were talking, like when it's the everydayness that the things that are hegemonic in the everyday are utterly different than what we experience right now. And we're aware that it's like that. That's what you'd seem to be describing to me is like, and it's nothing sort of grand or special. It's just like the values of where just people, you know, cooperate instead of compete because it's just kind of, you know, that routine, I guess, the culture. So I, maybe you could describe more of that. Cause I was just, I was just thinking about their space that I've been in where for a while it felt like everybody was acting out of completely different values without having to have them posted on a wall or written in a manifesto or, you know, documented. It was just kind of like, of course we, you know, of course um, we'll all just um, voluntaristically um, engage in everything we love doing to make sure things function on a daily basis. I've been in spaces like that for a while. Right. And, and in, in under quote, normal conditions of capitalism or states, um, as, as Matt was talking about, people kind of think they have to buy those things or wait for someone else to tell them to do it or suppress the things they care about, you know? And so, yeah, I'd love to hear you talk about more about that because it, I think that's all. Yeah. How do we cultivate I don't, I think it's such a, it's such, it's this weird thing. I've just been in spaces so many times when you, you can just watch like a light switch when people realize that they could just start acting like that now, which doesn't change all the other structures, but it, it does what you were saying, Matt. It's like, suddenly we are able, the culture only shifts because we shift our understandings of the culture, if that makes sense. Like how we, yeah, how we socialize with each other, how we eat together, how we hang out, how we have fun. And, and what is, why are we doing this except for people to have the, the freedom to live like in, in lovely, beautiful, joyful, connective, caring ways, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'm kind of rambling, but I hear you more talk about that, like how that feels, because I just think that that quality is why people want to build autonomy because they're like, I can be the fullness of myself in all the messiness of myself. And it feels joyful in a way that, that life, you know, and you don't yeah. question it; you just act that way. I don't know. That's a, that's a, that's incredible to me. We, I, I would like to hear more about that. I'd like to like to hear something, Takasin, about your experiences at Ravachava University as well. But I hear from Mariana that we've got some people on YouTube uh, who have got some questions that they would like to ask. Mariana, are you reading them? Are you able to unmute yourself and share some of the questions that we've got coming in there? Hi. Yeah. And um, there's um, a question from uh, a username, uh, Jolima, and they ask, do you see any problematic overlap with any of your projects and how do you deal with that? Do you distinguish the attempt to build autonomy from one from more right wing anti state movements? Uh, I'm not sure who that was addressed towards. But who, who wants um, to pick I'll up on that? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the one of the difficult things I could just jump in. I mean, it's not necessarily a right wing movement, but you could think about, you know, with service provision for as an example, or the mutual aid or something, in kind of crisis or disaster. There's this negotiation because, you know, the state has extracted all of this wealth and property and resources or something, and you know, there's a legitimate demand to kind of 
get it back, you know, to, for it to be redistributed. Um, but, you know, there's also, there's a, there's a difficult dynamic, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to formulate my thoughts, you know, I was thinking of Cindy's book earlier, and a uh, recent book, and, um, you know, there was this Jewish mutual aid society, a kind of Yiddish group in the early 20th century called the Workman Circle, active in New York, and, and they kind of did all kinds of educational health work, you know, they had cemeteries, they had kind of an orchestra, they had this entire fullness of life. And this was really before something like a welfare state was established, where in, a, in an American context, for better or worse, you had people self organize and build fraternal organizations or mutual aid societies, or they were done in a religious context, where you had something like community that you could kind of look at and point towards um, where people, you know, self organize to develop all these things, education, health, um nursing homes um whatever you know you might want to think of um child care and or kind of art aesthetics you know youth programs summer camps you know like cindy was talking about um and then you know even, as even burials the, even burials in those mutually groups that you're talking about yeah Just like you through know the whole of life yeah Anyway, yeah, through the whole of life, yeah, and, and every domain of life, you know, cultural, artistic, you know, social, um, et cetera, political. And then, you know, there's this difficult dynamic where in the mid-century you have the kind of development of the welfare state, you know, which is, you know, maybe, you know, provided services to more people in total, but, you know, simultaneously led to a lot of these mutual aid societies and fraternal organizations and religious movements to decline. So you had the less specificity of a kind of cultural communal orientation and more into kind of individualized citizens that receive aid from the state. And you know, I'm thinking also the, the dynamic Dennis was talking about of the different kind of land extraction that took place in Spain and across Europe and how there's this little part of the commons left in terms of land and how do we rebuild these mutual aid societies and kind of fraternal organizations and cooperation without kind of reverting back to relieving the state of its kind of duty to provide the services that it it can and should provide with kind of you know taxes or whatever everything it's it's taken i think that's again in the last year with the mutual aid proliferation um, how do we, you know, demand, you know, like, like the free vaccine, for example, you know, that wasn't necessarily, you know, foregone conclusion that the vaccine would be free or the kind of the, the amount of food, you know, free food that was demanded from the state to provide, you know, in different cities and different pantries and things like that. So how do you not just withdraw um, into your own kind of cluster and, and do your own thing, still kind of maintain a demand of, of the state in the market? But, you know, they're, not to be nostalgic, but there is a loss for these kind of like the workman circle or these different fraternal organizations, you know, that had a real sense of community or something that I think a lot of us do not feel we have access to any longer. So how do we rebuild this kind of these cultures and spaces? And I think, and, you know, one thing I want to mention is I think we do it materially. I think a big part is material infrastructure. It's not just, you know, our social relationships. We have to build our own, for lack of a better word, institutionality um, with kind of infrastructure and resources that we kind of control and maintain for ourselves. But I think this is one of the dynamics I just wanted to touch on this question about quote unquote right wing or sort of libertarian aspects um, about how mutual aid might relate to the state. Just, you know, that was something that came to mind, but curious what other people think as well. I think Marianne has posted some questions yeah. in the chat. If people yeah. want to look at that, yeah. yeah we, 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 we've got another question, Cindy. I'll come to you in a wee while, but somebody you may have seen in the chat has been asking if you want to say anything more about what happened in Cheran. I think Carlos is in Mexico. He might want to know a little bit about that. But we were going to go back to you, Tecosin, as well, and you might want to pick up on some of those ideas which Matt was talking about there, because I think we're beginning to talk about the sort of um, infrastructure that you might want on something which is on a, on a, on a bigger scale, if I'm, if I'm following rightly on the ideas there. Um, and I, I, you, you, I, I, I don't know, I'm wondering about in Rojava what sort of social control there is over 
bigger things and and, and how it affects the economy uh, how how are um, utilities given it uh, got to people and so on and so forth and one thing i was interested in is what the role of the media is in rojava in, in capitalist modernity the media plays a very very strong role on trying to normalize uh people's way of behaving and so on and so forth i wonder what the role of the media was there uh, sorry so many so many questions so many thoughts they're probably all a little bit random what what's what's been your experience there in rojava with regard to uh your, your time at the university and education maybe you pick up on that or something else i'm trying to write these all down uh, <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry yeah i was gonna, i'm gonna ask <laughs> Maybe to pick up on that, but like, how does how does mutual aid and material sort of um, how people's material lives look in Rojava? Sort of how that works would be interesting. Yeah. Too. Over to you, take us. <laughs> Thanks for all of those. Um, <laughs> Can so, you play? Um, no. Yeah, let me give you some things that are difficult to get otherwise. So I was very privileged to go to a PYD meeting in my local neighbourhood. Uh, it was in the park just across the road. And we, we wandered across and there's a big fountain in the middle and they were spraying water everywhere to keep the air cool for everyone, you know, and a lot of trees on the left and a table with a representative, a woman from PYD. And we moved to the left and there's about 300 people sitting in the trees and it was about 75% women. Um, so there's already a revolution there. Um, and... Uh, so anyway, there was a big speech, but afterwards there was questions. So the first question, a woman stood up and said, uh, sugar has become very expensive. Uh, my family is quite rich, but my neighbors are poor. What should I do? Uh, and, and then after that, uh, another person stood up who's a private farmer from outside the city. He said that uh, the uh, local administration had banned the drilling of uh, more wells for water because of the water table for private farmers and the representative for pyd answered both questions the same way uh, she said increase your friendships with the people around you and that was a solution to both problems and i cannot exaggerate the level of idealism in this in this revolution of course, we all accept idealism as a very positive thing. And obviously capitalism says it's a ridiculous thing, but we don't. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, this just come back and back again. It's the solution to things is increasing your friendships. When I first got here, I said to my responsible, I, I said, so I'm, I've just arrived in Rojava. I don't know the cultural rules. You know, I don't know how I can sit, what I should wear. I'm not supposed to wear this, by the way. These elbows are, uh, um, and, and all these things. Can you tell me the cultural rules? And he said, there's only one law in Rojava, and that is that you have to be our friend. And, and then everyone, there, there, there were no other rules. It, the, the a level of actual physical freedom was actually just in, incredible. Um, and they really are basing everything on this, you know. Um, Workman's Circle had this idea, the friend also, I mean, maybe, you know, the, the, oh. they, the, the journal was called The Friend. It's, uh, I mean, <clears throat> the internationals quite often make a mistake when they get here because you're supposed to stand up when a stranger comes in the room and greet them. But it's a total misunderstanding. Um, and it's communicated wrong from Rojavans to internationals as well. What's happening is that Rojavans are so incredibly excited and full of curiosity and in a positive way, like a child is. Um, and I don't mean that in a negative way at all. It's like, I really feel like I'm surrounded by children all the time. The, the, the massive amount of curiosity. They get up because of that. It's not because there's a rule to stand up, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the friendship is, is just so strong here. And my heart, uh, I remember my responsible said, you're, you're not our friend at the moment. You haven't got it yet. And after three months, and it was only three months, he came back to me and said, you've got it now. 
and I, <laughs> I hadn't even been aware my heart had just copied it and I was just experiencing these these huge amounts of friendship to strangers you know and the whole thing works on that um so I can't remember the question now but I'd like to tell the story because the friends the friends is this vague massive mass of society meeting each other and making decisions and developing stuff where decisions are made in about seven or eight months ago they intervened in the economy um, and this was something so this was explained to me in my education <clears throat> from Hevel uh, S he was he, he covered um, uh, economy for us and um, so the embargo had started to create a rich and powerful trader smuggler car class in Rojava that were bringing goods in and selling them and they were getting rich and powerful so normally the PYD should go to the communities and say strengthen friendship and you you deal with it you know um but they realized this time and the the, the teacher said you know we, we had to be practical about this it was getting out of hand so they intervened um and what is interesting about this is not the way that they solved it, it's the fact that it was such a difficult thing for them to do to directly intervene in society, you know. And what they did, of course, was then just start bringing in loads of goods themselves. They created uh, very low cost supermarkets in all the main cities and just started selling stuff and just undercutting the, the smugglers to take the carpet out from under them. And it was a great success. It was implemented very delicately and so no opposition armies formed and complained about it or anything and it was it was a big success you know obviously the friends are doing an enormous amount of other stuff they've meant a lot of roads they've set up an internet provider a mobile internet so they're, they're doing a lot of stuff and you can look at the yearly accounts on Rojava Information Center I think the, they come to about 120 million that they spend on and it it details of the stuff that they're doing. Um, a lot of, you know, Rojava's development has been throttled by the embargo. We can't do the things that we want to do because of the embargo. Um, and so, you know, we're still using Syriatel, the state phone provider for all of our phone communication, you know. Um, and I think actually the internet provider that the friend set up was on the back of that anyway and set up for them. So a lot of that's happening. Um, yeah, media. Uh, I mean, the problem with media, and this is for me, we've got a revolutionary TV station called Sturk TV, which means Star TV. My good friend is, is head of it, actually. He's an incredible person. He's seven foot tall huge booming personality he's absolutely lovely guy so full of love and he just works 24 7 um for the revolution he's a cadre and that means he's given an oath to the revolution to never marry and to just work for the revolution for the rest of his life and this is this is the cadre movement um, it's very exciting a lot of arab people have started becoming cadres in the east and that's a huge success, that is, because there was, you know, the big danger of um, racism and, and conflict happening between Arab and Kurd. And it, it seems like we might be making huge headway there. So that's very exciting. In terms of media, you know, I watch the news. I can understand it now. Um, it's positivist. So in the sense that it just reports things that you can see and hear. So it reports the conflicts. It reports the... A meeting so it, it's not feminist it doesn't report on changing morality in society or the success of the pyd's ability to try and increase, increase friendship or the stuff it's doing like that so um yeah i mean there's this revolutionary tv station i've worked in it um there are a lot of other tv stations including the state stuff and the turkish stuff um that's about all i know about it really um it, it really just does in, uh, report events university you mentioned um so i'll go there next week after the quarantine to 
meet my very, very sweet and lovely students and have English conversation with them. And of course, I immediately talk about politics all the time. And it's fascinating to talk to them about feminism and um, LGBT rights, animal rights and things like this. Um, but yeah, Rojava University has four year courses now. And that's really hopeful. I mean, the revolution is going to have been here for a decade next year. So it's really, really, um, it's, it's an inspiring place, the university. It really has a great feeling of hope around it. Um, and you see, you see people who are romantically together, walking around, holding hands. Um, and none of, none of the women have, well, very few of the women even have headscarves on. Everyone's dressed like people dress in Europe, for example, jeans and T-shirt and stuff. And it's an incredibly liberal city. I mean, at, at night, uh, sorry, I'm just going all over the place now. Um, at night, you can see single women by themselves walking around. You know, the, 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 the liberalness of Kamish law, which is very, very much Kurdish. I mean, if you go to Al Raqqa, which is also in Rosava, you'll still see women being led around on chains. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just there's a huge difference there. Um, I have got something I want to talk about, but it will be a little bit longer and it's not related to the question. So maybe someone else wants to talk for a while. I tell you what, we've been talking for um, about an hour and a half half now haven't we um i'd like to give dennis a chance to talk about the freeing spaces product project that he's involved in and then take us in maybe we can come back to you there i don't know how you people feel should we go on for another 20 minutes yeah okay to, 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 to wrap it up so 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 we'll do that we'll go on for about another 20 minutes dennis i'm going to come across to you because i know that this is a little bit on your mind um would you would you like to talk a little bit about the freeing space project which is bubbling up yeah, this is this is something that we're just setting up, me and some other people, and uh, it's it's really beta right now, freeing space, singular, freeingspace.com. And the idea of it is to have like a, a map. And that map is first of all a tool. It doesn't need to be totally overloaded with ideology or with dogmatism or whatever. It's just something people can use. There's uh, there's a couple of like um, uh, criteria to be on the map, which is like you're a nonprofit, you're not a state entity. Uh, you don't exclude people on the basis of identity, um, etc. Maybe there's one more. But anyway, the idea is to map sort of the outside of new liberal capitalism. And like we talked before a little bit about scaling versus networking. I totally agree. Networking is a better term. But um, capital and the state are entities that are inherently expensive. Like, like with capital, Marx uh, had this little formula, right? This algorithm M, money becomes commodity becomes M, comma, more money. And that, that, that's colonized the world. And the state is also an entity that just wants more and more power and it concentrates power. It's, it's inherent to how, what it is as an entity. So if you want to somehow organize against that, you also have to expand a network, et cetera. And freeing space is, I think, one attempt of sort of like um, making that possible. I think autonomy, we talked about this, is something totally different in the city than in rural areas. Um, but, but I think space is still essential. Like um, capitalism used to be industrial, it created things. Now in the West, less so. It became more and more rentier capitalism that just extracts profit by taking people's rent, by uh, having pay, like, yeah, rentier, by, by extracting money through financial um, property, intellectual property, etc. cetera. Uh, and real estate is a big deal in that. And to, to free space sort of from those pressures, um, I think is important. Um, so to, to, to visualize freed spaces. And of course, if you put it like that, you make it sound black and white, which it never is because almost everything is gray, right? <laughs> in this, like we are living in a world that's like dominated by capitalist forces. So, 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 so there is no, almost no black or white there, but to, to have, uh, to, to make this visible, I think is, it could be a cool tool. And that's something we're working on to basically build resources and infrastructure and, and share them and, and uh, facilitate uh, networking them. Um, before I also mentioned that I think autonomy and self-sufficiency are very much um, 
intertwined or something. You cannot have one without the other. Uh, it functions in a couple of different ways, right? Like if you are more self-sufficient, if you grow your own food or if you make you have your own medical capacities, right? Um, like it, it attacks capital in some ways. It's not just like going to the foundry. It's also not a retreat or an escapism or something. No, you, 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 you build capacities together. And by doing so, you dry up flows of money. Uh, you have less need for wage labor. You don't pay taxes or less taxes. And, that, and, you, and you might take away some sources of legitimacy for the state by doing healthcare yourself, by doing ed education yourself. And gardening in that sense is political too. And I think freeing space is an effort to map many of those efforts. And my hope would be that it can also connect them better. Like Matt, what you're doing is awesome. Uh, so, so live with Woodbine and it, like you can see also that it's very different in the countryside than in the city right because some of the things like a Sunday dinner like it like that that's that can only be radical in such an alienating context context like New York almost like <laughs> like for many people that's just what they do but if, if we had a Woodbine in a city nearby we, we could have these exchange networks you know we have food it's free it doesn't cost us anything like we get hunters giving us fucking wild boars and like we cut them up in pieces and we like we you have these capacities we make stoves for free um this is just the foundry example that i know best because i'm living here part of the time but i think there's there's many many projects that have capacities and if they could network it it could, could somehow yeah function in this kind of dual power way and um, and and be an be an active force uh, for autonomy and against um state and capital um so yeah freeingspace.com is something that we're like we're mapping the outside of capitalism somehow and it's really beta right now it doesn't look pretty yet but uh, it will one day hopefully and yeah that's, so dennis uh, anybody, uh, anybody who's watching this on youtube oh. or anybody who's catching up on it then the, the way to get involved in that would be to go to freeingspace.com yeah um i don't think we wrote an email address on it i don't know if there is an email server attached to it uh, but you could also find me on facebook if you want to get involved with that uh we have a then i will give you like we have a like an excel sheet that people are adding spaces to and then some like this is really beta right now we're just starting on this um and like like the nice thing about it would be also like it's it's, it's singular right space because there's only one world and if we can mark uh, areas rather than just like put dots, then you could say, hey, you know, 1% of New York is, well, New York's probably less than 1% is, is freed or something. And you can do these kind of funny things uh, to do like the outside of capitalism does exist and people are constructing it. And to sort of like bring those many, many varied and heterogeneous efforts together, I think that's a little bit um, what, what I'm trying to do with it. But as I said, it's also just a tool. Like I don't need to overload it with ideology. It's also just, if you move to a new city, you can see where you can get uh, groceries without uh, feeding uh, the hydra of capital, so to say. <laughs> we, okay, we, we've got some other yeah. ideas coming along in the chat about ideas for reading groups and everything. And I've got a cat that's extraordinarily hungry at the feet down here. But anyway, um, I'm gonna go back to Tekasin and because I think there was something you wanted to input into this Tekasin. And then some of you may have noticed in the chat, there was a question a little while ago asking you what your favorite book is. So I wonder if uh, when, when Tekasin, you've, you've said your piece, maybe we could all just like to give an idea of a, a, a book to, to give people some stimulation and some ideas to think about on this theme of building autonomy, something along those lines. I'm not gonna do any harm with reading your book, Cindy. I'm sure that that'd be a very good one to start off with. Tekasin, I was gonna hand back to you at this point here and you might wanna wrap up with your favorite book reader. That's easy, Ecology of Freedom. Um, so uh, I, I remember not where, but Bookchin talked about us needing to bring the happiness into the revolution immediately. It had to be part of it. It wasn't something we tried to get afterwards. After we'd done the revolution, we'll buy. And I, I, I'm having amazing feelings of freedom in my mind that I had no, I hadn't understood before I came here. This, 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 this real releases of freedom that I just had no way of figuring out what they would be without being here. And so I wanted to describe that. Um, and, and this happened to me like, you know, an epiphany as usual. I, uh, I needed to get to the university at two o'clock in the afternoon and I needed to be on time. So I told the chauffeur that was in one of our groups in the morning, I said, I'm gonna need to move from the TV station to the university at two o'clock. And he looked at me like I was just completely mad. And he 
and he said, you need to tell me at 10, 10 to 2. Um, anyway, didn't really understand. And I went to the Sturt TV station. And uh, at 10 to 2, I came down. The, uh, and as I walked down the stairs, I was looking a little bit hopeless and a little bit worried about not getting to the university on time. And uh, just surrounded by five people asking me if there was anything I needed because I was looking a little bit lost. And I said, well, I uh, kind of need to get to the university by two. And they happened to be chauffeurs, but they were all about to do something. They all went on their phones and just went across the network. And there was someone outside in two minutes who I'd never met before who took me to the university and I got there on time. And I suddenly started to realize because my day, I have no idea what it's going to be like. Because in, in, in this culture, you, your primary focus is to do things for the pre people around you, not implement your own agenda. Um, and so I realized that, um, you know, in, in Europe, there is certainty, you know, when the bus is going to leave, you know, how much you'll be paid at the end of the month, you know, uh, where the supermarket is, where to get food, uh, you know, when your meeting will be, you know, what you're going to use, you know, where, when, and how all the time there is this material certainty to the whole of your life. In Rojava, there is no material certainty at all. You have no idea how you're going to get somewhere. You've got no idea where you're going to eat or if you're going to wash up or who house you're going to be in or where you're going to sleep tonight. And this isn't just for revolutionaries. I'll get onto that in a minute. Um, but you see, there is certainty in Rojava. The certainty that there is, is that wherever you go, everyone is going to be your best friend. And you can sleep at any of their houses. They'll all feed you. They'll all drive you to where you want to go. So you know that that's going to happen in a huge way. And suddenly, uh, I stopped trying to plan ahead, stopped trying to have any material certainty in my mind I just knew that wherever I go, someone might just come up and say, well, I, uh, my, my computer stopped working and I just get in the car and go and fix it. Um, and so I just started flowing. My mind stopped trying to control things and plan things. And that was just this incredible freedom that suddenly came over me. And I realized that everyone else was just doing and responding constantly to friendships. And this is, you can't plan ahead here because everyone's responding to phone calls of friends to do things. So anyway, I, I go to the shops a lot. And uh, when, when I go in a shop, I just immediately sit behind the counter and start having a cup of coffee um, in any shop I go to, whether I've been in it or not, you know, this is what everyone does. Everyone just sits down and chats and stuff. And um, someone came in and bought a table and the shopkeeper was, you know, obviously it was a friend because it always is it's a community um, and the, the, the shopkeeper got in the car with the table in the car and it was just assumed that I would get in as well. So I got in as well, I went off to, to their house and then drank tea. And we came back and there was someone else looking after the shop and I realized that actually the shop, shopkeeper's life is flowing as well. Even though their shop is open during that time, at least half the time they're not there. Now, in the, in the, in the capitalist world, uh, he or she would be breaking into the home delivery market and working out how much money they might have. And they would open at nine o'clock and they would calculate the money for the day. In that shopkeeper's mind, he opens for his friends, not because it's nine o'clock. His, 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 his mind is different. So he is free from the suffering of the numbers. And I think this is what this is, is one of the things that makes our lives in positivism so painful is just this huge mathematical thing that we see reality through and it stops us connecting with reality and each other. Um, you know, they, they call this, the, they call the life here the natural life and the idea that it's uh, uh, connected more emotionally with everything. Um, yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say. I hope that made sense.
And what was your book again? It was the Bookchin one, wasn't it? On well, ecology. The ecology of Freedom by Bookchin, yeah. Sorry, ecology. <laughs> no, no, no. Den Dennis, there's a question for you to pick up about the Zapatistas and then tell us a book that we need to read without mentioning Michel Foucault. Sorry, I was muted. The question was wondering what Dennis thinks about the Zapatista trip through Europe. Is this scaling across of autonomy you were referring to a while ago? Um, I, th I think it's great that they're coming to Europe. Um, I've, I've actually invited them to the foundry and they said they, they would come. So that, that's, that, that, that's amazing. Um, I think we can learn a lot from them. It's also interesting that after they announced this trip, a lot of like kind of collectives and initiatives that hardly knew each other had to organize something together and they started getting in touch. So before the Zapatist has even come here, it, it led to a, a networking that because of like fetishism of the small difference and like little conflicts that happened 20 years ago and that nobody remembers, the places were just weren't even in touch anymore. So this is <laughs> this is this is uh, quite uh, amazing, I think. And um, yeah, uh, and like yes, so it, it 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 did create that that it had that networking effect. And um, yeah, they'll go on the boat soon, and I hope they'll come at some point to the foundry. Um, yeah, that's great. A book? It's, I don't know. I don't have a favorite book. What, it, politically, what influenced me most is probably Tikkun. Who? Tikkun, the, the collective, the French collective. Tikkun, they, they were a radical group of writers around shortly before 9-11, they wrote. And the Invisible Committee is the same people. Um, yeah. Oh, thanks. I, Matt? Yeah. Okay. Matt, a book to read. We're going to be wrapping up soon. Matt, a book to read? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, yeah, I would agree, you know, with Dennis, I think Takun is really important on a lot of these questions. And there's an anonymous text called Call that I think was really helpful. But just other things that came to mind, there's a book um, called Democratic Autonomy in Northern Kurdistan that was inspired by Jadil, and it was it was um, about the Kurdish movement in Turkey, and it was kind of uh, produced and it was a research project that happened before the Rojava revolution. And I think it's really interesting to think about how these concepts were existing and playing out um, before we were talking, and I think Cindy and others about how do these things happen and where do these things come from. And the work that people do for years or decades conceptually and doing organizing and doing small groups and committees and different movements that don't have, you know, national or international media coverage and attention. I think that book is really interesting to think about the kind of seeding that happened that then blossomed in Rojava following the Civil War. Another thing that comes to mind really quick is um, PM Press put out an anthology of um, the writings of Ben Morea and the Motherfuckers, maybe eight, nine years ago. And, you know, they're uh, an anarchist group and collective and commune in New York City in around 1968. And as a New Yorker, I think that's really fascinating, you know, not just to look to the Kurdish movement, which is, you know, very far and very far and in a lot of ways to, to New York, but to think about the kind of the groups and, and attempts and experiments that happen where you are and where you find yourselves and what you can learn from them. So somehow between this motherfucker anthology and this this Kurdish book from, from Turkey, you know, before the Rojava revolution, I think were really formative in helping me think about autonomy. And, and like Dennis, I think Takun and this book Call as well were really helpful to, to think about these questions. But thanks again for having me. It was really, you know, a pleasure to, to listen to everyone's experiences and thoughts about all this. Yeah, this has been really cool getting together like this. I mean, um, just yeah. before I turn to you, Cindy, if there's anybody here on YouTube who's, who's wanting to sort of... Uh, get in touch with us or, or, or find out some more about the books to read or whatever then please just leave a comment under the video uh which you're watching on youtube we'll pick up on that and we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can get back to you somehow and see if we can build on all of this i think there's a lot more to come out of this cindy i'm over to you now yeah um i the first thing i want to recommend because i really love the format today where we're just sharing and i really want like i love books <laughs> but i really want to recommend people just getting together and sharing stories like a lot, a lot of us have all sorts of, I, all these experiences are popping into my mind of things I've been part of just listening to other people that I, you kind of forget about or you, right? So I think us telling each other our stories uh, um, and in terms of uh, what I would recommend reading right now though, I've been um, revisiting some of the Zapatista communiques with a group of my friends. And it's, I was joking that we should all be 
compelled to uh, read five minutes of Zapatista with our morning coffee um, to remember uh, why we are rebels and what life is about. So I would highly recommend any Zapatista communique. And um, I was thinking of a short audio piece um, by one of the people that wrote for the, the book I did, Deciding for Ourselves, named Scott Campbell. He did a follow-up to his piece on Sharon as a, an interview, and it's on It's Going Down. And he talks about how they dealt with the pandemic and it, but it also explains the history of Tehran and how they, they ended up being this, like they're basically an autonomous municipality, autonomous city, a very different history and experience of than the Zapatistas, but, but, but uh, compatible. <laughs> and um, yeah, and part of the way that, that, that whole autonomous space started was them, you know, long history of resistance and trying to defend, wanting to defend their community. Um, but one night, one morning, some women got upset and uh, started bonfires and um, to blockade some loggers that were coming to destroy their town. And people started gathering around the bonfires and just telling each other stories about what they wanted and what they were scared of. And those bonfires became the the basis for that autonomous community. Like in, they, they figuratively now still meet around bonfires, but people made bonfires all over the city. And they literally started by telling each other stories about what they wanted their autonomy to look like. So I really want to emphasize that. And um, and the last thing I just want to throw out, I was just thinking at the very beginning of the pandemic, which to me was just this moment of, and still is profound grief and trauma. Um, <clears throat> I really want to, I think these moments when we're experiencing like globally collective trauma right now, um, the ways that people are really, what Matt has said, what people just, you know, are, are, are we're, we're creatures, right? We're, we're, no, we're, we're animal creatures in an ecosystem. And I think the first response of many people was to find people to share their stories and to, to help each other and to be in solidarity with and the, the flowering and mutual aid. But I was thinking at the beginning, I totally kind of just popped into my head when you were talking, um, Dennis, at the beginning, I was like, what the hell should I be doing? All my projects had fallen apart. I was isolated from my communities. Um, through mutual aid disaster relief, one thing I could do is like, oh, I can collect all the mutual aid projects that are popping up and just create a, a, gu a guide. So there's something called the collective care directory on mutual aid disaster reliefs um, website. But there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of projects. In the first two weeks of the pandemic, I was just like spent half my day just adding projects. And you can say, okay, they're just listings. But I was really struck by how through people going to that, they found friends. They found in that expansive sense of friendship that you were talking about. Take us in, in like Rojava. It's like people that were feeling like they were and thinking like them. And all these preconditions of, of friendship started that are still to this day have like grown and nurtured. And what people did with that at first, I really was struck by like what we need most in these moments is, is friendship. As people started going, how can we take care of each other? And a lot of things that came out of the mutual aid projects you know, are material, but they were also people listening to each other and offering care. And some of the first mutual aid I was thinking about that people wanted to provide each other was, was masks and other protection, um, right? So that we could make sure we were all gonna survive long enough to continue to share these stories. So again, I, I really, you know, our, our survival is not a given at this moment in human history, as is the ecosystems that we're part of. So I, I really wanna encourage people to both, that's why I guess I was recommending communiques to remember why we're doing this, because we all are going through a lot of pain and we all have a lot of a lot of capacity to share with each other and passions and, and friendships and mutual aid and how we can you know, remind ourselves that we have life to give each other. Um, but yeah, also to remember that this moment, like we, we are making a choice to, it's, it's like creating cultures right now of autonomy are a choice, is a choice to survive together and thrive together. I, I really wanna, it's, it's a choice we can make right now to find each other. That's all, I keep coming back. It's a silly little phrase, but it's like, we are all we have and we are all we need. And there, there is nothing but us, right? And, and creating this, I really appreciate us like gathering to this to remind ourselves that we really are all we have. And, and through our friendships, we are saying we wanna to survive together and, and for each other. Well, thank you for that. Thank you so much for that. I would, a number of you have mentioned this term friendship uh, this evening. I feel as though I've made some friends tonight. I've really enjoyed dealing with what we've, we've been doing here. I, we've been talking about something to read. I might just almost make a, a sort of a plug because 
two weeks at this time in two weeks time we're going to be um discussing the uh, Shila Le Guin text those who walked oh. away from Las Amalas <laughs> yeah so I mean anybody who wants to come along and read that text it's a short text anybody wants to come along and talk about it uh together then we're going to do it this time in a fortnight's time we can send details out to you thank you all you should, thank I'm you sorry so to, you should you should read yeah. the other piece with it mk jemison's those who did not walk away they're really good pieces to read together okay 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 well i'll look into that as and well. it's That's short really cool i'm gonna get mariana to get her artwork together on this one and give it a pr promotion because she's so good at doing all of that sort of stuff there listen capa negra podemos terminar con la grabación ahora yo, yo creo ah eh? Um, thank you so very much. We're going to end the meeting. We're going to be in touch again. We've made some friends tonight. This has been really good fun. I've thoroughly enjoyed doing it all with you. Okay. So thank you all very much. And we'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thanks everyone. This was thank awesome. Thanks. Thanks.